Welcome to TechNow, the web series for ServiceNow administrators, developers of all skill levels on a wide variety of ServiceNow topics. Thank you for joining us. It is my great pleasure to have with us a special guest today to talk about Flow Designer and Integration Hub and all of the stuff we've come out. We haven't talked about this in about 18 months. It's crazy. And that's three releases. So you can imagine how much stuff we've added to the platform and added to these features since I think we talked about it in Kingston. It was a while ago. So there's Madrid and New York and... Orlando, and next month we'll talk a little bit about what's coming in Paris, but we can't talk about that yet. What we can talk about is what we've got today. So let's get started. If you haven't met me before, my name is Chuck Tomasi. I am from ServiceNow, been here for 10 years, was a customer for a couple before that, and uh, enjoying every minute of it as I think I have the world's greatest job. So I get to learn and share information with you in venues like this. And I am very, very happy to be here and be able to do that. Next up is the one and only Craig Stepp. Let me unmute myself and I will uh, <laughs> introduce myself then. So I'm Craig Stepp. I'm the program manager. Actually, I should change that. I think I'm staff programmer now uh, at Cloud Labs. And I support all the infrastructure of for all the classes that we do with uh, any of the training, like at Knowledge, or any of the vir uh, virtual classes you may be taking uh, through ServiceNow. And I've been doing that for qu quite a while now. Feels like 20 years, but actually it's been more like uh, four or five. And I've been at ServiceNow since 2014, and been the co-host of TechNow uh, with uh, Chuck and everybody since 2016. So here I am, and I will toss it over to Michael. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Michael Slobodnik, so I'm a uh, platform architect at ServiceNow. Um, like Chuck, I used to work for a customer. I used to work for a partner as well doing implementations. Um, my big claim to fame was building a whole game system in ServiceNow back before we even had Aspen. Um, so that's kind of fun as well. And then uh, I guess the best part is I re got rejected from dental school multiple times, so I just <laughs> fell back to IT like everything else. Um, and that being said, I'm excited to be here. I've known Chuck for several years, Craig, maybe a few years, whatever. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot of dog banging as my kids who just came home are going to be knocking on the door. So they may be uh, unknowing participants. <laughs> Family man. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, real quick, want to go over our agenda. We are going to be talking about Flow Designer and Integration Hub, as I mentioned, for Madrid, New York, Orlando, the features that have come out there. Michael's going to be doing a demo and also, we'll take your Q&A in that live panel. If you're watching live, if you're watching this afterwards, put it in the comments on the community on YouTube, and we'll respond as quickly as possible there. So thank you very much again for joining us. If we don't get to your questions, please, apologies. There are typically lots of them on the live event. What we will then do is take those, all of them, answered and unanswered, and finish the job in the next day or so as we produce the video, we'll answer the questions, and those will be posted back to our community. So I will have all of the questions and all of the answers. Sometimes we even need to go deeper to the developers and product managers to get your answers. You ask awesome questions. And unlike the popular myth, we don't know everything about everything. So we have to check with the experts. <laughs> so want to uh, also recommend the Customer Success Center if you're not familiar with that. Real quick plug, go to servicenow.com slash success. Wherever you are on your customer journey, this is a great resource pool for you to dig in, dive deeper, find out what it takes to do an upgrade or implement a CMDB, all of that stuff to get the maximum value out of your investment in ServiceNow. Because after all, that's what your boss wants you to do, right? We paid money for this subscription and you're going to get the most out of it. This is how you can do that. Whether it's you or process manager or the platform owner, somebody should be going to the Success Center on a regular basis because there's always new content showing up there. Quick plug also for the developer portal, developer.servicenow.com, free personal developer instance, free learning plans, all the API reference, lots of great information over there, including some blog articles about Knowledge20 where Andrew and Brad and I, we pulled together and curated some of the sessions and workshops that we pulled out. So if you're looking for more information about Flow Designer, there's about 10 breakout sessions and uh, workshops that we've got direct links to that you can find and follow and do this stuff. I myself did one just 
what was it? Last week, weekend. <laughs> That's how I spent my weekend. I went and learned about data streams. <laughs> there was a debugging session, CCB 1427, I think it was, and a workshop about building data streams, CCW 1429. Now, I don't expect you to remember all these numbers, but what you can do, the knowledge site is still up at knowledge.servicenow.com. I know that's sort of an indirect plug to the developer portal, but it's still there. You can go get that hands-on material on demand. Use the instances that Craig spins up. He does this in his sleep, just out of the goodness of his heart. <laughs> yeah, this is how I spend my weekends, too. <laughs> <laughs> so please go right. check out developer.servicenow.com. There's a lot of great information over there. And with that, it's over to our subject matter expert, why he showed up, why he got out of bed this morning, and closed the door on the kids. Michael Slobodnik, it's over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, yeah. And when it comes to Flow Design and Integration Hub, I can't believe it's been 18 months since we've really started to talk about it, or at least on the uh, Tech Now uh, podcast as well. So there's been a lot of changes uh, as kind of the new workflow engine or new ish, I'll say. Um, they've spent a, the product management team has been wonderful for being able to be, build it, mature it, bridge the gaps with uh, the workflow engine or, or the older workflow engine. And now it's to the point where um, I want to say it's past what the, the capabilities of workflow could be. And so it's really well positioned for that no low code uh, citizen developer type of, of workflow, as well as being a central center point for integrations. So without further ado, I mean, there's been there, there's been so much on this and I've been working on this since it first came out. Uh, working with the product management team as well, um, going to knowledge and doing the labs. I think this is my third lab now where I've done done Flow Designer Integration Hub. So it's, uh, and the story keeps building bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I'm running out of, you know, I'm not running out of things to present. I'm just running, I have too much stuff to present. Um, but, you know, a lot of the big things that have come out from what I've seen and worked with, um, just in the flow designer piece, and, and it's kind of important while people see flow designer integration hub kind of as one because you build the integration hub stuff within flow designer, you know, as kind of capabilities that they are separate. So, you know, I kind of refer one in the other, but then there's times I kind of mix them up. So, you know, trying to keep that, uh, keep that straight. But um, on the flow designer thing, uh, on the flow designer piece, you know, getting into the decision tables and getting more from data driven type of workflow. It's something a lot of us have always done. Chuck, I'm sure you build work built workflows where you had some table to hold data and the workflow is making decisions based off that data. Well, now we just made that as a basic out of box capability for the whole platform. Um, other type of things we've seen even in Madrid is just to start to get that parity with workflow itself, you know, in parallel, do until, um, run as has actually been really powerful and it kind of is very simple, but, you know, in that sense of making sure flows can run as of somebody, uh, under their permissions, the run as is, is really critical for that. Um, but then also specifically being able to call workflows from flow designer. And so one of the things that product management has really, you know, realized as we all, all, all everyone realized with, with flow designer when it first came out is the fact that workflows aren't going to go away anytime soon. So a lot of customers who have hundreds of workflows, maybe thousands of workflows, you know, we can't, we're not expecting everyone to just move everything over like that. Uh, and so flow designer itself can call workflows so you can make things reusable and keep using what you already have. And, and as flow designer matures, maybe you migrate over, um, you know, I don't know, have any insight into if workflow will ever go away but we've never really taken anything away that customers already have. Um, content management system being a great example. Um, but that being said, you know, there will likely be that time where we say, hey, workflow is not gonna be turned on for new customers, Flow Designer is it. Um, and so, uh, and then Integration Hub is also a neat new key as well in terms of everything we have. So Madrid was just once again, getting into par parity with what we had, you know, being able to use the action API. And, and this one was really kind of neat where when you build these actions in Flow Designer, which are also kind of the spokes, if you will, that we have on an integration hub, how do you call them from other parts of the platform? Anywhere you can script, you can call. Um, same thing with just the improvements in Slack, attachment actions, and just the constant maturity with different things you can do or customers can do without the need to code. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to also do is just move away to more no low code, make it more powerful, build things faster, uh, and if anyone's taken any of the labs that I've had, you know, that's hopefully what you got out of that as well. Uh, New York, man, uh, New York, once again, some of the uh, uh, newer capabilities that I want to say kind of now are starting to go 
past workflow. Email triggers was kind of a big one. Um, I don't think there's really been much of a change to inbound email actions I, I, since I can remember. This is kind of the first time where I've actually seen it where it's like, wow, they have something else now. We can have input for email and we can do all the logic without having to script. Um, Chuck, I don't know if you remember having to script a lot of email, but man, parsing things out, it you know, yeah. can get a little cumbersome. Yeah. Um, but then some of the other things that we've really started to see is uh, dynamic inputs as well. And so, you know, this kind of goes with a capability called introspection, where if you have a spoke, um, you know, Salesforce spoke, for example, is, is a good example, of one that that's been being worked on before, where, you know, what if data changes in that other system? What if they add a new field? You know, the traditional old way is to go back to service now and have to go through and open up the flow or workflow and change, you know, make sure that that new field's being called and, and that's, you know, it has extra development time over it. With the dynamic inputs, it's now set up in such a way that when you use an action, for example, it can go through and query that other system to then bring additional parameters up into uh, up into the menu as well. So now you don't have to worry about factoring in for another field. It's just going to bring up all the available fields and show it. Um, very powerful. Um, I will admit, you know, the documentation site doesn't have. It's got good information in terms of how it needs to be, um, but um, you know, it's powerful once you kind of figure out how it all comes together. Um, you know, and then also um, the waiting for duration as a percentage of time, that's a huge one for SLAs. That's actually what was one of the key things that was holding Flow Designer back from, from being able to do the SLA workflow. Because um, everyone's always builds, always, everyone always built the workflows like, hey, 50% of the time towards my SLA, do this, 75% do this. We needed that in Flow Designer, that's there now. And then on the integration type things, um, there's been a, uh, lot of really interesting and new updates as well. Um, I know you can, everyone can read this in terms of the open API support and um, coming out with the subflow to automate password reset. But one of the, I want to say, smaller known integration hub uh, actions that have come out or uh, if capabilities is the JDBC step. So thinking about that, when you think how ServiceNow does JDBC right now, it's, it's you know, not too complicated. It connects into a database and pulls data over and that's it. Um, but I've always run into the question of, well, what if we want to write to a database? And the only answer we had up until New York release has always been, hey, we got to use PowerShell. I've done it before. It's doable. Um, but you still have to rely on like another technology to finish the integration. With the JDBC step now, we're taking SQL statements, putting it right in the action and we're pulling data from a from a database. We're writing data to a database, uh, and it's actually really powerful. Um, I love to couple the JDBC step with remote tables because now I've got my road, remote tables for SQL, remote tables for other systems like you know Jira, for example. Um, and you know, in terms of performance, yeah, as long as you're not doing a huge query, it it actually runs decently well, all things considered. Uh, and then Orlando, of course. Uh, with what we've had now is is I, I want to say this has been kind of uh, really fun to work with. <laughs> um, you know, on the flow designer piece, getting into transform functions itself, and it seems so simple, but there's times where you bring data back and then you have to go right into like a scripting step to parse things or find maybe a maximum value. The transform functions make it easy where right in the flow designer you can take a data element and say, I want to apply transform to it. Um, the lab that I did for Knowledge20, uh, we get into that a bit. Um, and there's a lot of transforms for it. I'm, I'm hoping that's going to grow out as you know more use cases come in, but it's a really great step in that no code, low code direction of really trying to, I want to say, compartmentalize the little things that you used to have to script for. Um, you know, and some of the other things that we've, we've seen as well is um, the dynamics flows and subflows. And that was one of those things where when I first kind of heard about them, I tried to figure out how does this work? What are the use cases for it? And suddenly I realized, oh, wait a minute. If I want to make a whole bunch of different subflows and I give them a bunch of names and my, my lab actually covers this, well, don't I want to be able to have some dynamic data elements where I could say we'll call flow subflow X, call subflow Y, but without all the overhead of doing like decision tables or if statements. And that's exactly what the dynamic flows and subflows does. Um, I can name you know, a, a first part of several subflows, something similar, and then I can maybe change the last 
you know, substring of it or whatever. And I've got a way to just call those based on names. Uh, and once you start working with it, it's really powerful because now you get out of a bunch of decision tables and you can take, you know, you end up taking flow that looks like it's your whole screen and cutting at least in half once you get rid of those decision and if statements really powerful makes things really clean michael the other um, the other uh, place i found subflows to be very very helpful is anytime you may want to use it as its own library function not just from within a flow yeah. but from within a script because you can't pass parameters to a flow but you can to a subflow so i'm asking myself almost every time does this really need to be a flow well, you know, obviously that depends on the trigger, but could you build the bulk of your flow into a subflow and then perhaps call it from a UI action, a business rule, a script action, somewhere else that says, hey, I'm going to need to run these steps, but pass it this glide record or pass it this uh, sys ID. Or, uh, I'm finding subflows yeah. to be extremely valuable, uh, more so than I originally thought. Well, not only that, so I use it for the exact same thing. And then also I found out that when it comes to security, like if I make an action, for example, that I want to write some data that may be typical for an administrator. Right now with the actions that you create, you don't have the ability to say, you know, run a system. You can only do that in subflows. So a lot of times I make actions and I wrap it in a subflow to have that additional flexibility into what I'm doing. So the majority of the things that I work with, especially if I'm calling things from scripts, for example, most of the time I build out a subflow for it and then I call that versus calling the action directly or flows themselves. Subflows are really powerful. Um, you know, and and it kind of seems weird to say, well, there's flows and subflows. You know, why have them separate? I understand, you know, in terms of, of the separation, flows to me are, are a little easier to kind of just build in general for the initial information of like triggers and such. such. Um, but subflows, if you're really getting advanced, subflows are where it's at. Um, and then on the integration stuff, you know, once again, just improving a lot of the um, ways that ServiceNow can integrate with various systems and themselves, um, you know, dynamic outputs, that was something that um, came out more from um, uh, different capabilities to have uh, different data come through, especially if you start to consider how that can factor in with dynamic uh, subflows or maybe dynamic inputs. Um, and then, you know, Chuck, you already said as well, data, data streams, you know, large data. Uh, you know, we live in a world where a lot of our customers have huge amounts of data. And for data coming into service now, they, there can't be that limitation of, you know, whatever, 10,000, 10, 20,000 records, whatever. Um, they need to handle with large amounts of data. Uh, and so those data streams and improving that is, is incredibly powerful as well. Um, and then you see things like the client software distribution, you know, it's starting to replace things that workflow traditionally would do. Now integration hub is doing it. Um, as things mature, you know, we'll also see a lot of our different products themselves that typically have workflow. They're going to start migrating flows over into, into integration hub and flow designer as well. So taking advantage of those new integrations, um, you know, it's incredibly powerful. Anybody who hasn't quite, you know, latched on to Integration Hub, if you're in an organization where you have to integrate with a lot of systems, you know, just remember uh, when it comes to how we're really building out the integrations, integration is gonna, Integration Hub's gonna have either A, new out-of-box integrations are coming there, or B, new capabilities for integrations are gonna be coming there. Um, this is our direction, this is the way we're moving, and, um, you know, it's really worth being able to start getting on that earlier than later so that way you don't have a lot of technical debt where if you're kind of holding off the more you hold off the the you know longer it'll be where when you do want to finally move over and take advantage of that you may have more technical debt to to do the migration or to you know go ahead and build it so um really powerful i'm excited where it's going i like i said doing three knowledge labs at this point getting into working with product management and uh you know We'll also get into some demos right here and uh, be able to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, enough PowerPoint. People can let's, actually see it. Let's so. see the stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Enough PowerPoint. Let's be realistic. I got my nice little list of things here. I'm like, all right, man, what do I show? There's so much stuff and we don't have a lot of time unless we can extend this maybe three more hours. There we go. We're good. All right. Although I would ask By the that, way, I yeah, have a fiber how, connection. How big so is your, um, how big, you might want to see if we can boost the font size a little bit though. Oh, I always forget to do that. Yeah, that's good, right? I like it. 125 is good. Perfect. All right.
should remember that. I always forget. Uh, you know, and really the first thing I want to start off with is decision tables. And decision tables, like I said, it's to help that data driven type of workflow that we have. And they seem a little complicated at first when you get into them. Um, and so being able to really kind of see and consider how they build together, it makes sense, but you just have to, you know, maybe see a good example of it. In this case, it's taking an, what's known as an answer table. So in this case, it's a custom table, but realistically, any table you have in ServiceNow can be used to hold answer data. In other words, the output that you want of some decision. And um, in, my, in my knowledge labs, I always had something where we're ordering food. So, you know, okay, I like food. Uh, and so I always relied on the decision table that for that. So here I have this custom table. All it's doing is storing output answers of different types of food. Nothing crazy about it. And um, if I then go to the decision table, we now start to come up with, all right, how do we build this together? And the first thing you have to keep in mind is that there's going to be some input to it. In this case, my input is going to be um, this COVID-19 case that I get that gets created. So it's the type of story where an organization is keeping track of COVID type of re requests, maybe pe uh, employees report cases, maybe they say, hey, I can't work because of childcare. They're just keeping track of this data to help manage it. And so you have to keep in mind what elements have to come in for my inputs. Is it data on a particular type of record? You know, HR case, incident case, um, or, and could there be multiple records as well? Um, so being able to keep in mind clearly to think, okay, I've got my output table there, great. Um, that's what it says here in, in my answer table. I've got my inputs that are going to be other different tables. Okay, great. I have that. And now let me put my decisions together. And so when I have some kind of decision, this is where I start to get in and say, hey, I need to figure out, you know, based upon the, the information that's coming in from that input, what the decision is going to be. Um, and I have a mechanical keyboard. I always apologize for it, but I love it. Uh, in this case, I'm adding in a new decision to say, hey, I want to be able to order, I think, White Castle food or maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe some other fast food type. And I want to use my input that I had from my COVID case. So if you see, I have my COVID-19 case right here, all those different inputs show up. And in this case, I'm even going to show some related fields. And I want to do something where, you know what, this person, uh, I have my affected employee and their state is, I'll say Ohio. White Castle is currently in Ohio, gotta love it. And then I just select my answer. And the other thing, and I don't know how many people really know this or not, but this reference here, if that's a uh, known as a document type, is ServiceNow's way of being able to reference any table in the whole environment, not just, um, where you have to define a reference and that reference definition is pointing to a specific table. Document types are great for pointing anywhere. Funny, funny you should mention that. I just did a video on that yesterday. <laughs> Document ID fields awesome. and the dependent table names. You bet. So go over to the community exactly. if you want to read more about that. Absolutely. I recommend it. Um, I've been using documents more, especially for things where, like I said, I want to have a reference that could be any table. Not just like maybe task. Task is great, gets you a lot, but doesn't get you everything. Uh, and so once you've got your decision table set up in Flow Designer, it's really nice and easy where you can say, hey, I just simply want to add in a new decision. And I can say, well, let's see, order food. And I've got my decision table right there. And I get my outputs based upon those decisions. Okay, great. So it's, it's kind of like how workflow we used to have switch. Now we've got the decision tables for it as well. Let's say also keep in mind decision tables themselves um, are also based upon, uh, they have an API, so you can call them from scripts. Um, there's also different con conditions to match. And it is really a simple type of, of capability, but now we are really moving towards that data-driven type of workflow where, hey, instead of having to check out a flow and make cha changes based upon an if statement, I can now go to go to maybe super users and say, hey, look, here's your decision table. Um, feel free to go ahead and change the decisions however you want. The workflow will handle it based upon those outputs. Very simple, 
You don't have to have admins to do it. It's data driven. So you don't have to go through the traditional checking out the flow and publishing and testing in you know, maybe two weeks or so. You can just make your change here. Um, like I said, very simple, but very powerful. And, and as a platform feature, um, you know, it's, it's helping move towards that direction where we just want to make things easier. So, yeah, I love decision tables. Um, you know, I want to say the only downside to them is if I, if you add in a new output decision, you then have to go through and, and configure maybe workflow to say, okay, what's going to happen for happen from this new decision. Um, and it's one of those things where I always kind of consider, okay, can you get out of that? And, and realistically, I don't think you can, because now if you've got a new decision, there's going to be new activities and that you have to open workflow for. Um, but that being said, you want to make it configurable to at least change the data that comes into it. Easy, fantastic to do. Um, and then even then, uh, uh, like I said before, flow designer decision tables seem very simple, very powerful. Uh, another really simple, powerful capability that I'm really starting to enjoy and really starting to kind of figure out in terms of how they work are those transform functions. And I don't know if you remember, but when Flow Designer first came out, um, there was a big gap in it, and it was a simple gap. But if you're kind of a, an experienced ServiceNow person, it, it's very, I want to say it was kind of a little annoying. Um, it was a type of thing where if you want to do some kind of simple data element like for example you know gs dot get user id like something it's a, it's a it's a method you know part of the platform you can you know type it in your in your sleep and you just wanted to get that and put that in there somewhere in the flow you really couldn't do it um you had to create a whole new script action and it was really cumbersome um then they finally came out with those script script lines where you can add that kind of thing great that was fantastic well, now it's the same thing for those dynamic, uh, for those transforms, where if you call some data element, you don't have to always script it out to parse out or change data. And a really good example of that, that that I've been working with is just the idea of saying, you know, what if I get a bunch of different data that I need to transform in some way? So one of the things that I've done for my lab is, uh, you know, when it comes to building out all these different capabilities, I always create APIs, various APIs. Um, to go ahead and work with it. And one of those APIs that I worked with was just pulling in a bunch of COVID-19 cases, um, you know, based upon, for example, uh, well, I'm going to use Ohio because that's where I currently live. And once I get that data back, the one challenge is, though, it's sending all the data back as an array. You know, very common to call APIs and you get data that's mixed in somewhere. And really, if I want to go through then and have to sort that out, the old way prior to Orlando has always been, well, you got to do a custom action, script it out, and you return the value. Now I can do something where if I want to get the actual number from that full array that's coming back, I can go ahead and say, hey, you know what? First of all, let me do my activity here where I'm updating a record. My record that I'm updating is, is my COVID case, if you will. And I just want to add in some of those work notes. Ohio, Ohio. Boy, this is where I'm always like, is it is or ours? I'm going to say R. I'm not a uh, English major, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, but I can go ahead and pull my data element, and now I get this nice little FX part right here. So similar to how we started to put in this, uh, you know, inline scripting. Now we're doing this additional capability to say, hey, how do I want to transform this data? Uh, and if you really go through it, you've, you've got a good amount. In this case, I've got, um, I think I wanted to do math right here. I've got a maximum number uh, and the input is array. So you do have to be careful of what the inputs are. In this case, when I created that API, I had to make sure that, hey, you know, I've got to return the data as an array, right? Um, but you're also starting to get into other different things, like, for example, SQL and sanitizing a SQL value or being able to go through and say, you know, I want to do something with a string. I just want to take maybe the last few characters of, a, of, of maybe a substring, or maybe I want to put everything to uppercase or lowercase. Um, and so it's getting that flexibility without having to do a custom action where you're scripting. Uh, now, granted, it's not going to do everything, but if it, if it can do enough where 70, 80% of your scripting is now out, that's a pretty huge win. 
Uh, and I almost want to say with date and time, that's another big thing as well, because I, I don't know, Chuck, if you've worked a lot with, well, I know you have, but for uh, anyone listening, if you've listened, if you've worked a lot with date and times in service now, it, it can be a little tricky with the subtraction and adding and changing. Now we've got the way to just do it very quickly and easily. But, um, you know, now there's that ability to say, hey, let's go ahead and pull off a max and add that in there. So it'll cut off, but we can see it. And this is what I also really like about it as well. You start to see this list of applied transforms. So now it's not just one transform. You may be doing a few different transforms that are that are taking place. Um, I, uh, one of the questions from when we had our, uh, our our lab itself, one of the questions that came up was, "Hey, is there a limitation in the number of transforms?" Um, product management itself, you know, came back and just said, "Well, they didn't put any limitations in the number you can have. Um, they they pretty much said, hey, it's probably going to depend more on the UI because if you have 20 different transforms going on, this list will get pretty big and." that point you may want to consider doing a custom script um, but that being said you know being able to do those transform functions very simple very powerful getting out of that you know cumbersome coding of a custom action again and and I really like it like I said very similar to those inline scripts that they that they came out with as well I have to keep reminding myself those are there <laughs> they can save you a lot of time you know what yeah they yeah they no kidding really I was do. just thinking the same thing yeah. And, and you know what, once again, from those slides we had, you know, since the past 18 month of updates, man, there's so much there. I keep forgetting what came out. I keep forgetting when it came out. Yeah. Um, so I'm always have to, having to remind myself. And as a developer, my natural yeah. instinct is I'll just go write a custom action and use it a couple of times. Like, oh, wait, no, there's a way to do a split and a sort right there. <laughs> I don't need to yep, do that. I'm, man, I'm guilty of that as well. Um, there's so many times I want to go straight to scripting and I keep forgetting, oh, I can do this. I keep telling people now, hey, instead of scripting, why don't you just build a flow out of it and then you just call that flow? That was so powerful. Just, oh, let yeah. me do a snippet. There's there's an inner voice that says, oh, that was great, Chuck, that you did all this script include stuff and outbound rest calls. Now go do it in flow. <laughs> so don't be me. Don't do it the hard way first and then have to redo your work. <laughs> yeah, let Chuck be your bad example. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, WWNCD. What would Chuck? Oh, what would Chuck not do? WWCND. I don't know. All right. Um, you know, now I want to go ahead and get just kind of a step more technical. Um, dynamic inputs. Once again, very powerful to keep ServiceNow, especially with integrations, very flexible. Um, adjusting to other. Uh, systems out there, but it help really helping to be able to build out to say, you know, I want to build once and then have it be able to adjust automatically based upon it. Uh, and I'll be honest, I would definitely say dynamic inputs, very powerful, but there's a but here. It's one of those things that will, will, would take more advanced scripting, um, knowledge as well. Um, you know, the type of thing that, uh, would be more for advanced service now developers. That being said, um, it's also incredibly powerful. It's worth getting into as well. Um, in fact, I definitely recommend go to our document site, Dynamic Inputs. It talks about them. More importantly, it has information about the output of what it needs to be in order to work. This I spent a little bit of time figuring out. But that being said, Dynamic Inputs are, are actually kind of simple in the sense of, hey, you know what? Once again, this is just another action out there. So like any action, if I have inputs, I can call, I can include my inputs, but more importantly, I can go ahead and have whatever activity I'm going to, to work with. That's going to be dynamic. So in this case, I'm just calling a rest step. I'm calling my, you know, service now instant. That's got this food ordering API with it. And I'm just calling a get. And more than likely, if you're doing a rest, you're probably going to be using get, right? You're pulling data and this is the tricky part here. Once I do my rest step and I, I get my initial response back, I then have to parse it out and it has to be an output of JSON. Um, this is what I spent a little time figuring out and I'll, I'll hopefully other people will, will get this and, and be able to learn from it as well. And it really comes to this. Um, I went through, I scripted it out where I've got my, um, if I remember my option array, which then goes into JSON. 
And the last step in there is to go ahead and format that JSON to say data. And then there's my array of you know nested JSON data as well. That has to be just like that. You have to have it set up in data. And then here's my, for example, label, name, whatever. Um, pardon me, it should be label and name for the data that's coming through. And once you get that in place, great. You can pull data from anywhere. But this was the trickiest part right here. This does have to be um, specifically formatted. And so, you know, worth getting through. What I probably should do is make a script include and then just pop it on the share and, you know, make it easy. But that being said, very powerful once you get this built out, because now when it comes to my various APIs, um, I've got one particular action to go ahead and order food. And right now, that action itself has everything hard coded. In fact, if I bring it up, here we go, get food actions. Oops, actually, no, I got the wrong one. Um, I think it's order food. There we go. This order food action right here, everything's hard coded. You can see that I've got my um, different item. It's a choice. It's donut, pizza, White Castle. I could have more options there, but if that external system changed, I don't know. In this case, I can go through and say, you know what? Instead of doing this as a choice, I want to use this as my dynamic choice. And so now I just get that uh, action that I just created and worked with. So it's kind of interesting because we're using Flow Designer to uh, Flow Designer Integration Hub to help make Flow Designer Integration Hub more flexible. And that that was the um, big aha but, moment for me as well is that you have to first create that action that does the fetching, whether you're fetching from ServiceNow or another system yeah. through REST or through a Glide Record lookup. You're building that list, and that becomes your little subroutine that says, "Go get the food options, go get the account names, go get the customer." issue types, whatever it is that you need to fetch. And that becomes the choiceless builder for you, if you like. And, and I went, wow, that's brilliant that we now have this dynamic yeah. inputs and dynamic outputs. Because like you said, it's a bit of an inception moment where you say, I have to build an action so another action can work dynamically. Okay, that's pretty flexible. Yep. Exactly. I mean, it's very powerful. And like I said before, you know, the biggest part that I had trying to get over was just how do I format the output from that? Once yeah. you figure that out, oh, okay, I got this. Um, but now when I'm going through and saying, hey, you know what? I want to go ahead and I have my action for, I think I order food. Now instead of having everything hard coded, I can go ahead and do my choice. And now I have a bunch of options. You know, Pita House is down the street from me. Wonderful, wonderful falafel, McDonald's, whatever. And as the data changes on that external system, it's going to change here. Um, I think also out of box, if I remember correctly, there's already an out of box um, uh, dynamic input actions to go ahead and query another ServiceNow instance to pull like available tables. And then from that, it can take an input from the table and then query and pull available fields as well. Uh, and so there, there is something there out of box for people to start to work with. Man, if you do integrations, well, our out of box integrations with Jira, um, things that look at with Salesforce, any external system, if it can, if the data schema can change, do dynamic inputs. It's going to make it so much easier in the long run. Uh, and I would definitely say that's probably one of the most advanced advanced parts about it as well. Um, one of the other things I really want to get into. Uh, from that whole list, like I said, there's so much, it's really just kind of getting into the power of SQL. And I know that it's not really thought of in, in uh, some of the use cases we have, especially for cloud-based technologies. But that being said, there's still a lot of customers that have SQL databases out there. Um, and there's always that question of how do we integrate? And like I said before, prior to integration, uh, prior to Orlando, we always we had to use PowerShell. Not that I can do it, I figured it out, and ServiceNow can save the scripts and you know, we're decent. But it wasn't very, I want to say, easy to work with in the sense of you have to write out all the PowerShell and figure out what inputs out are and everything. Now, with uh, what we have on SQL, we've got the ability to have a step right here in the JDBC step. So I have an out-of-box demo already with one of my demo instances where it's showing available SQL data. In fact, here it is right here. If I do a refresh, my mid-server will query SQL. It'll pull data back. Um, it does take a few extra seconds because you got to remember mid servers, they only, you know, update every what, 10, 15 seconds, whatever you set the setting for. 
But here's the simple, powerful part about it. This is my JDBC step right here. This is straight SQL. And this is easy for people to understand. I mean, once you get the database connection set up, easy. I can go through and say, you know what? I want to insert new data. And just like, oops, yeah, I guess I copied the wrong thing, but no problem because I got my paste bot here. And I've got it set up where I've got an insert now. So now when I go through, I can test this and run this. No problem. It's going to do its thing. I've now got my updated SQL, and now I've got a great, easy way to interact with my integrated uh, databases. And there it is, 007. I think I, uh, yeah, error in SQL. There we go. And uh, it's very simple. But now you start understanding the power here. It's like, wait a minute. I can pull data from SQL. I can write data to SQL. I can also write my um, inbound web services as well, scripted REST APIs. I now have a platform where I can actually hook up REST APIs to my internal SQL databases. I mean, <laughs> we're now getting really as as ServiceNow is an integrated, you know, system for for other use cases, and not even just for ServiceNow. It's the beginning of it. It's really kind of cool when you when you think about it. Well, that JDBC yeah, step. Yeah, you could almost you could almost call it an integrator itself because you're going to be integrating yeah. with everything. The platform yeah. of platforms. <laughs> exactly. We've heard that before. You could you could also exactly. use, you know, just another insight is you, your JDBC step could be instrumental in fetching data for your dynamic inputs or outputs. It's like, wow, okay. Exactly. That's mind blown on how many different ways you can uh, put these puzzle pieces together. Exactly. And so any customers that have those use cases where they've got maybe archaic databases with, you know, legacy systems or maybe just data out there that they're having to manage and you know, they actually now have a solution that they can consider for integrations, you know, being able to take those SQL databases and make it a secure, easy REST API um, without having to custom build an API. It's, it's actually really mm -hmm. kind of neat when you think of those cap capabilities as well. And some customers are really mature. They've already got API endpoints available, uh, or maybe they have an enterprise message box. A lot of customers don't. They can do service now for it if, uh, you know, and, and really are Scripted REST APIs are pretty, actually, actually pretty easy to work with, and you can test them and uh, very powerful. All right, good. I've got a few more minutes left, so I'm going to take advantage of this and just kind of switch over to some of the dynamic subflows. And I know there's, there's so much to get into. Um, I wish we had like another hour. But, uh, you know, that being said, 18 months from now, when we get into the next, next webinar podcast and everything that's going on, it's going to be, uh, uh, boy, there's going to be even more content. Um, that being said, the dynamic subflows, Chuck and I, you and I were just talking about this, you know, some time ago, the power of it, where I can go ahead and take a templated subflow. And this is the key part about it as well, because you're going to see here in a few minutes, you come to that question and say, you know, if I call a subflow, how do I know what inputs and outputs I'm going to be interacting with? So having a template for your dynamic subflow is key because when you want to go call that subflow, this is how the flow designer knows what to call. But from this um, templated subflow, that all it has is inputs and outputs and one, one simple log, because you do have to publish it in order to publish a subflow, you have to have some action take place. So a log is the easiest way to do it. Um, and from this template, I was able to just say, hey, let me go ahead and copy, give this a name of maybe California at the end of it and you know then do my activities for you know something related to california as like a COVID reporting for the state of california and then maybe another one for ohio and the really powerful use case of this is considering hey you know what in the story that i put together different state governments could have different apis available for reporting things or interacting with different different systems um heaven forbid all 50 states you know really get standardized on on some form of communication so what if you have to put all those in to interact with various state governments, but you don't want to have a huge mess of decision tables or if statements. And dynamic subflows are great because you say you have your template. From that template, you copy and you know adjust accordingly for each state. And now when I've got my flow in here, I've got the new flow logic that says, hey, call a dynamic flow. 
And the first part about this is you have to choose the template. This is what, you know, takes a little bit to understanding here, but once you choose your template, you then have the ability to say, okay, well, I first part of my name is going to be report to state. And then I'm going to leave it at the end of blank. And then I can go through and say, you know, let's go ahead and do this for COVID case. And I think I have my affected employee and let's use their state. So I've got a dynamic subflow for California, one for Ohio, you know, ultimately you could potentially have all 50. Yes, you'd have to manage those subflows for each one. Like I said, they all may have their different APIs, but you can make it where the main flow that's doing the work doesn't have to worry about that. It's just calling the right one based upon some input. Um, and then there may be other information that once again, we can have dynamic. Yeah, I'm just putting number in. Michael, what is the purpose of the template at, at runtime? It seems like you've already used it to create your California flow. So what, what purpose does it serve here? I'm not clear on that. So you don't see it just yet, but you're going to see it here in a minute, but it is to define what inputs and outputs are going to be for the subflow. So the oh, template's going to okay, contain that okay. information and the flow is going to read it to know what do I do. So if you see these inputs here that I'm putting in, yep. it's getting that from the template. Gotcha. Um, because when you think about all these various subflows, it doesn't know what it's going to call. So it has to have some framework to know what the inputs are and outputs are going to be. Could you then tailor that, say California needed one more input? Uh, you would have to do, you'd have to put that in template. So... Okay. While you may not add any data, for example, if you've got the excess inputs, um, you would put everything into the template because you don't know if you're going to call California, right? So you'd have to put in the template. And then if you call the California subflow, for example, um, that's where you start to get a little bit cumbersome where you, you may have to do some if statement or something okay. to say, okay, this is a one-off case. I don't want to add additional data to it. Gotcha. Um, Best thing to do is just have all those subflows, ha subflows have the same input and then go to that subflow specifically and figure out what data you're really going to use. Keep it in the subflow. So my inputs are going to be the same, but maybe there's something I, I don't include like zip code because the state of California doesn't care. Um, and so I go through and use the name to say, hey, this is the subflow I'm going to call. Now, once again, you do have to do an extra step to say, I want to pull some data out of my subflow. And once again, this is where the template comes out. So this is where we have the get flow outputs, because you got to remember, we have a subflow running, but ServiceNow, this flow, technically, when you're designing it, the designer does not know which subflow is really being called. So once again, it has to rely on that template. In this case, I choose my template again in that context, uh, in the flow template. And then the context that I have this time is that dynamic flow that I just called. So you can have multiple dynamic flows, and then you're getting data from each one, you know, maybe different data sets. Um, and there's my context record. And so now, when I'm going through and doing something like, hey, I want to update a record from that output from that dynamic flow, See my created record. And maybe I've got a state reference number. Now going to the data pill picker, I've got my get flow outputs and I've got that response number. That response number is coming from the template. So there are extra steps to use dynamic subflows. But however, these what? three lines on my flow designer is way cleaner than doing a decision table of 50 states. I don't really <laughs> want to attempt that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, once again, I'm designing it, but I don't know what I'm calling. So I have to use a template to know okay. what my inputs are, are going to be, what my outputs are going to be, and, you know, getting that output. Um, but once again, very powerful. All right. So before we go into um, just quick takeaways on this one. So, you know, I, I probably said this if anyone's ever taken any lab with me, but the biggest thing is um, um, focus on the design, data-driven um, properties as well. You know, be able to make it flexible. Um, 
it's all about building quickly. Flow Designer, you can build flows much faster than, than doing the coding. And then also get your apps into production. It, you know, there's a lot of app building platforms out there. We're focused on get it in production quickly. Um, State of Washington and the COVID apps were a great example of that. My team, some of my team got involved with it and they did design within a weekend and boom, they had apps out there, you know, um, very powerful. And that's what it's all about. Documentation for all the stuff that Michael has talked about is available on docs.servicenow.com. The community, I'll be posting this article. There's lots of great stuff out there on Flow. If you've got any questions about Flow Designer or Integration Hub, please go there and ask questions. There's hundreds of thousands of people that are there to help. I kid you not. That's the number I heard recently. Uh, Developer.servicenow.com. Get yourself a free PDI. One of the questions in the Q&A today was, hey, I'm trying this on New York. Can Orlando help? I said, I don't know the specifics, but you could go get a PDI on Orlando and try it out with very little risk to mm -hmm. you, your company, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of these episodes, we've been doing this for quite some time, are available on, let's see, there's our PDI. We're now closing about 80 topics in the last seven years. So go check them out at the bit.ly link you see there. And of course, the Success Center. So we do have some Q&A oh, for you. And don't forget, yeah. since... Hey, by the way, real quick, just to remind everybody that if you want to take one of the courses that uh, were offered during Knowledge, they're still available. So you can go uh, do this through the Knowledge site, um, or is it? Now, I think they're on, they're on Now Learning. Yeah, so the labs and workshops are nowlearning.servicenow.com. You could type in the number if you know mm -hmm. it. I just went CCW fourteen twenty nine. There was the data stream one. Okay, a couple of questions we've been saving up for. We have been answering these live in the background for the some of them. Uh, if I build out a flow, this is from Douglas, if I build out a flow and then realize, hey, this should really be in a subflow, is there an easy way to, quote, convert a flow to a subflow so that I can take advantage of the features you described, like passing in parameters, calling it from a script API with parameters, that kind of thing? Oh, man. That's, that's a really great use case, and I've done that, where I started a flow, and I'm like, oh, man, I should do subflow. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> there is not an easy out-of-box way to do it. Um, I've looked at some of the tables before. Uh, if you try to go to the tables, it kind of kicks you to Flow Designer. So your product is trying to just keep you within the rails, so sure. to speak. Um, currently, there is not, but that's a really good, uh, I think a really great use case of something. I'm going to go talk to the product manager and be like, hey, can we just have a little switch or something? I, I think it should be possible. Yeah, we're going to have to copy. copy. You know, maybe a way to copy you know, to a, another Flow. Right, or clone or something. And yeah. say, do you want to clone yeah, this clone to a Flow or Subflow? Yeah. 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 We'll have to talk to Jake about that one. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Douglas. Yes. We will get you a, a, we'll publish your answer on the, on the community afterward. Uh, we have another one. I'm not going to try and pronounce the name because I will massacre this badly. So look up record. If a record isn't found, you're familiar with look up record and look up records. And I'm going to answer this one because I had this exact same thought in the shower this morning. <laughs> Okay. I kid you not. This this is how recent this stuff comes in. I'm, I'm working with this all the time, so yep. it's kind of fun. Uh, if you do a lookup record and the record isn't found in the table, Flow Designer stops and goes, hey, there was an error. Okay. It doesn't even throw an exception so you can go on, you know, like a try catch in script and keep going. Is there a better way to do this? And I was thinking about this myself this morning because I had to write a custom action and then I went, no, 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 no. There is a way. Use lookup records, say you want one record, so the <laughs> limit is one, and it will return a parameter of count, telling you count. zero if you didn't find the record, one if you did. It will not die. It will just simply say, I found nothing. And you can do an if condition based on that count. That was my solution. I tested it 20 minutes yeah, before this camera started and it worked. Yeah. So I can verify that. And, and go. I've had a lab or demo where the exact same thing. I, I spent all this time saying, why can't look up record? Tell me if it's not, if it's not right. found. Look up records works great. Just do it. Yeah. Use the plural, look up records and just base yep. it off of how many you count. And, and if you want to just use the max count of one saying, look, I really only need one. So if I've got a hundred million records in there and many, many, many of them match, I really just want one. Just say, fine, I found one or I didn't find one. That's your set limit if you're familiar with the Glide record query for that. So uh, is there any way to create a variable and update it through subsequent steps, i.e. a counter that can be updated, a variable that can be shared between steps, that sort of thing? So not right now. Um, I'm not going to 
comment in terms of specifics. Um, I just know that that uh, capability has been definitely talked about. Yeah. Uh, I think they've got it in the pipeline and I would reach out to your account team and say, Hey, can we talk to the product manager for flow designer? And they could give you details. I'm very happy because I was thinking the same thing. I'm often creating a, a field on a form yeah. to count for me. And then I'm making some, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's fans of scratch pad is all I'm going to say. <laughs> if we want to hashtag. Yes. <laughs> yes. There, I love a lot of flow design, a lot of stuff. That's one of the things that has a gap. Product manager knows about it. Talk to your account team. Say, can we talk to a, a product manager for Flow Designer? There we go. Thank you, Michael. Unfortunately, yeah. we've run out of time. We still have a number of questions left. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, again, go to the community. Look for Tech Now episode 76 in a couple of days, and I will have those posted there. We'll do our best to answer them, get deeper input. And until next time, oh, next time is going to be July 28th. We have the Paris right. platform features. You don't want to miss that because if you miss it live, okay, if you miss it live, you will have to wait until September to see it on demand. So if you want the latest platform features for Paris, because early access starts about that time and shortly thereafter, we're going to flood you with all these new features. So <laughs> it's yeah. There's a and lot to talk about alert, in Paris. There's some interesting stuff coming. There is. I'm, I'm going to watch that from my new home in Orlando. Definitely. Pick up a phone at 3 a.m. if you have to. So with that, we are out of time, and I bid you a fond farewell. Thank you once again for joining us, and we'll talk to you again next month, if not sooner. Thanks, right. Michael. Thanks, Craig. All right, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. All right.